In September 1893, Frank Duria, a bicycle repairman from Chicopee, Mass., made history by taking the first ever test drive of a gasoline-powered vehicle in the United States. The motor wagon, as named by Frank and his brother Charles, drove all of 600 feet before sputtering to a stop. But that short drive set the wheels in motion for an industry that today represents 3.5% of the U.S. GDP, which translates to roughly 264 million registered vehicles. Of course, this didn't happen overnight. In fact, it took decades from the invention of the gas-powered vehicle to the emergence of a mass market for automobiles. Years of persistence and patience, invention and innovation. But can that be replicated? Will that recipe work for the next generation of personal travel? Today we'll hear from Professor Gary Pisano about his case entitled Honda Jet. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you're listening to Cold Call. So we are all sitting there in the classroom. The professor walks in. And, and they look up and you know it's coming. Oh, the dreaded cold call. Gary Pisano's teaching and research focus on strategy, innovation, management, and manufacturing. He's also the author of the forthcoming book entitled Creative Construction, The DNA of Sustained Innovation. Gary, that sounds like a perfect title for this case. Thanks for joining me today. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I was actually thinking about the Jetsons when I first read this case. You know, will we ever have the George Jetson uh, personal flying car thing? And I, I know this case doesn't answer that question, but it gets us kind of in, in pointed in that direction. I think people will really enjoy hearing about it. So maybe you can start just by setting the case up for us. Who's the protagonist and what's on his mind? Yeah, so the, the protagonist is a gentleman called Michimasa Fujino. And the case starts in December of 2015 when they're delivering the first jet. So Honda developed a light jet called 6 to 8 passengers. Their concept of it was the Civic of private jets. So something small, but yet roomy and fun to be in. Yeah. And he joined the project in 1985. So the case kind of starts 30 years after yeah. he begins the program with delivering the first jet and now thinking about all the new challenges after this 30-year odyssey of starting and running this program from nothing to delivering the first jet, and they have a 100-jet bat log, to how do I scale the organization? Yeah. How did you hear about this? What prompted you to, to, to look at Honda I, Jet? I came across it in a story somewhere in the news. I can't remember the exact publication, but it just, it just fascinated me because my research over the last 10, 15 years has been about innovation in large companies and how do you scale innovation? How do large enterprises take on transformational innovation? And I see this case on Honda, big, well-known car company, coming out with a really innovative jet. And my first thought was, well, everything we know and everything we've been taught about innovation, this isn't supposed to happen. Mm -hmm. A company like Honda is not supposed to come up with this sort of radical transformational innovation. This is supposed to be the domain of startups, you know, a kind of Tesla-like story. Uh, but this was Honda. And so I'm like, how did that happen? And what did they do? And it kind of fit into the broader themes I was beginning to research for my book, Creative Construction. So I initially approached them about five or six years ago to do the case. And they politely declined. They said, we're not ready yet. And then two or three years later, I approached them and they said, we're not ready yet. And we persisted over about five to, I think it was probably about five to seven years of- That is persistence. Yeah, yeah. And finally, once they got the jet approved and it was on the market, I think they felt comfortable talking about the project. And then once we did it, they were incredibly open and, and fantastic to, yeah. uh, to work with. So I guess this is the thing, the notion of personal jets. What does that industry opportunity look like? Well, it could be quite large. The very light jet market is a jet that holds, again, historically, these would be the smallest private jets or corporate jets a generally pretty cramped, about six people, but you sit with kind of overlapping legs. Yeah. And the market is actually quite small. It's like $370 million. So it's a tiny, tiny market. Uh -huh. Because realistically, $4.5 million doesn't buy you much when it comes to a jet. Most corporate jets out there are $10 million and above 30, 40, 50, 60 million. You get these large Gulf streams and others. Mm -hmm. And Honda's view was there's potential at this, we'll call it the low end of the market to develop something that would really be quite attractive to use and more comfortable. And that's where they had this notion of the Civic. So if you think about what Honda did in the car market in the you know late 60s, early 70s, 
the market for subcompact cars in America was quite small because subcompact cars were noisy and cramped and not very comfortable and not very fun. And the Civic, while still a subcompact car, was a little roomier, kind of cooler, and more fun to drive. Still being a subcompact car, but it transformed the subcompact car market. Yeah. And so they said, could we do the same thing in the jet market? Could we create the Civic of Honda, a Civic of light jets, so it would be roomier, more comfortable, and a more interesting product. So that was their bet that they've gone after to get a jet that's about four and a half million, will hold six passengers, but comfortably be quieter. And that could then extend the market. I think the bet is, look, it's 370 million now, but if we actually had a much better product, does that market get bigger? Are there small companies that are currently not using private jets that will start to use private jets once mm -hmm. they see the economics of it? Because for many small businesses, if you're not near a major hub, traveling is a pain. If you're in Greensboro, North Carolina, where they're located, you've got to make two stops sometimes to get to a place. And that is a huge drain on productivity. So their argument is, can we create a product that is now effective for these smaller businesses to use that might never have thought about buying a private jet and say, look, the per hour costs are the same as flying first class or uh, for wealthy individuals who are, never saw themselves as wealthy enough to have their own jet, to say, you could have your own jet, or you yeah. could share this jet at a much lower cost than you thought, yeah. and maybe potentially expand it. And the case gets into some of the uh, the models that they have in mind, so I, I want to delve into yep. that a little bit later, but so this has been a long journey for the protagonist here. How, how did this journey unfold for him? It starts in 1985. He's a newly minted PhD in aeronautical engineering who joined Honda, and it's true, in Honda and other Japanese auto companies would hire people with aeronautical engineering backgrounds, partly because the auto industry in Japan has always been much bigger and healthier and stronger than the uh, aircraft industry. Mm -hmm. So the graduates wanted to go to work for companies like Honda because they wanted to work on cars and some of them wanted to work on Formula One. So Honda actually had a Formula One team. So he was excited about working for Honda and doing car development. Really fascinating guy, Michimasa Fujino, because not only is he a PhD in aeronautical engineering, he was actually on, I'm not, I'm not sure if this is in the case, but it's public knowledge, he was on the Japanese national ping pong team. Really? Yeah, and he was also an extraordinary baseball player, a top baseball player in Japan. But he said in Japan, you have to, unlike America, you can't sort of go to university and be an athlete. There's no concept of a student athlete, so you choose. And he chose, he chose, uh, chose school. Uh-huh. But he joins Honda right around sort of 1984, 1985, and he, he starts working on cars, which he loves, and he loves seeing his work go into production. And then he gets tapped for this secret research project to work on an aircraft. And it was really just an exploratory research program. And truth be told, he wasn't really that excited about doing it. Yeah. Sounds risky. I mean, well, in a place like Honda, so if they're just exploring this idea, what does that mean if they decide not to pursue Exactly. It? And it's a small team. And also his view was, it was frustrating. His thinking was, this isn't going to go anywhere. I want to see things get commercialized. I don't want to just work on research for research's sake. I want to see a product go on the market. But he's convinced to do it. And again, I convinced, I'm not sure how much bargaining power yeah. he had as a young, <laughs> to, I think he was about 25 years old at the time. So he joins the project. And it starts as four Japanese engineers going off to uh, Mississippi to learn aircraft design. And they take flying lessons and they start the project there at this little four of them. And then they project goes from there and it grows. So this team didn't even necessarily have experience in aeronautical engineering. They were newly minted graduates, PhDs in aeronautical engineering. Yeah. But there's a lot of practical things that you need to learn. And Honda as a corporation had no experience in it yeah. at all. That was the other thing that fascinated me about the case in terms of my research, which is how does a company build a capability from the ground up? Right. Initially, Honda thought oh, we can take a lot of the things from cars and apply them to aircraft. That was the initial hypothesis. It was a leverage their expertise in engineering and car design to aircraft. And what they learned very early on is uh, airplanes are not cars with wings. <laughs> that's what they, and, and you have to really build the capability from the ground up. So that's really what the story is about, is how they built this capability for designing and manufacturing aircraft from the ground up. The case also makes it clear that it, they're put in a difficult position, and this might be an idea that you can talk a little bit about what the ideas are in your book. How difficult is it to be an entrepreneur in an established culture where you're trying to push an idea forward that maybe everybody else within that firm isn't necessarily on board with? Absolutely. I mean, it was very difficult at times. So, you know, Honda's today, it's over $100 billion in revenue for cars. I mean, Honda's a car company. Yeah. It, yes, it's got uh, motorcycles and it's got lawn and garden equipment, generators and lawnmowers, but 99% of the revenue is cars. 
And so there you are in this little team, isolated. And, you know, the car industry is cyclical. Mm -hmm. So when things go down in the car industry, money gets tight. And so you can imagine sitting around a table and, you know, the head of Honda car division is wanting to ask about why their budget's being cut. And they look across the table at uh, yeah. the head of the aircraft project and <laughs> right. say, why are we wasting money on that? A number of times this project wavered in terms of how much support there was. So I think that was one major challenge. And I think uh, over this long period of time, you have changes in senior management who is supportive and who is not supportive of the project, who thinks this is a good idea. And actually throughout, I mean, Honda kept saying, well, we, we don't really want to commercialize this. This is just something to work on and we're exploring. But there wasn't until 2006 a commitment to build an aircraft and market it. What was the turning point? Fujito himself, he starts out as one of this team of four, but relatively early on, he really becomes the project leader and then officially becomes the project leader. And he has these 20 engineers and they're working in Greensboro, North Carolina in a bunker. Basically, all 20 of them are Japanese. They spoke, my understanding, very little English. They were working seven days a week. It's for... all still secret at this point, too. Yeah, I think at this point, maybe a little less secret because it was a little bit bigger. But Fujino realized that they couldn't just create a jet that was like everyone else's because they would just get clobbered. There's established players. You can't compete with the established players with the same concept. And that was this idea of the Civic. To, you know, how do we create a transformational product? But they had actually a very specific technical engineering challenge, which is one of the reasons small jets are cramped. There's only two places at that time was known you could put aircraft engines. So one is you could put them under the wing. So most of us, our commercial planes are big. A lot of times the engines are under the wing, but you need a big plane to do that because there has to be space. Or you put them on the tail or on the tail of the fuselage. So most private jets, if you look at them, that's where the engines are. The problem is if you put them on the tail of the plane, you have to put in a lot of superstructure into the fuselage to support the weight of the engines. And that takes up space. Mm -hmm. So you take a small interior and you make it smaller. The second problem is the engines wind up right next to your head if you're yeah. a passenger. So it's really loud. And Fujino describes it as like being inside a speaker. So his view was that's the reason this market is so small. You're spending four and a half million dollars on a product which is really cramped. You have to, if you sit across from each other, you kind of sit with your legs kind of interlocking yeah. um, and it's loud and you can't have a conversation. And he said, but how can we solve that problem? Because we have this engine configuration problem. At the time, and he describes it this way, the first day of aeronautical engineering graduate programs, you learn that you cannot put engines over the wings. That is like accepted as a fact, because if the engines are over the wings, you'll create interference, you'll push air down, the airplane won't fly, which is a problem. And he challenges that notion. One night, he's literally going through some textbooks. It's kind of fascinating. He had been moving, and he was going through some old textbooks. And he goes back to a textbook from the 50s and looks at the original aeronautical fluid dynamics equations uh -huh. that govern the flow of air over the wing. He realizes that there's multiple flows over the wings. It's kind of it's a convex equation. And his hypothesis is if you can locate the engine just right over the wing, you can maybe get the two airflows to cancel each other out mm. and then you don't have the interference. But it's just theory. So he's got this idea and he first describes it to some other engineers and they, they just don't believe it. Yeah. And then he builds a simulation model, mathematical simulation model that shows it could work. And then he builds a prototype to test. Now, the first thing that happens is he shows it to his boss who calls it the single worst piece of engineering he had seen in his <laughs> life. So hardly encouraging, right? Yeah. But then Fujito takes it to Boeing. They had a deal to test their airplanes in Boeing's wind tunnels. The Boeing engineers looked at this prototype with the engines over the wings. It looked like no other airplane. They immediately said, you're not putting that in our wind tunnel. Yeah. That thing's going to break apart. This is a $100 million wind tunnel, and you're going to destroy it. He showed them the simulations. He managed to convince them to try it. This is the persistence part. Yeah, the persistence, yeah. right? And... It works. And he said, actually, they, after they, the data comes in, the Boeing engineers, like, they changed their views. They're asking all sorts of questions about the design. They showed it worked. And they patented it. He published the article describing the design in a journal. He was told it would end his career. It was too, you know, ridiculous. Wow. The paper gets widely praised. And so he builds that credibility on the outside of Honda, which helps him build the support inside Honda. But then at this stage, the view from Honda, and this is really fascinating, we describe this in the case, they're going to cancel the program because they're not sure they want to commercialize a jet. He's quite depressed about it, but he comes up with this idea. There's an air show every year in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. It's famous where all the new planes come. And, mm -hmm. and he convinces Honda senior management to let him take a test plane to go there and show it. And he says explicitly not to 
try to commercialize or sell this because I know we're not going to commercialize this. But wouldn't it be good? You know, the team worked hard on this. It'd be great for their morale. And it would be great to show the world what Honda can do. Technically, mm-hmm. it'd be good for our reputation. But I have no intention of taking orders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He goes there. And of course, what happens is lots of people get really excited about the plane. Yeah. In fact, one actually gets so excited, they sent a check to the CEO of Honda saying, I want, I want <laughs> you know, the first one. A brilliant move. That's a judo move. I right. Think. Yeah. Because yeah. I think all along he realized, I've got to get this plane in front of people, build momentum on the outside. And, you know, then at that point, he has a number of discussions with Honda senior management, the CEO, and they agree to do it. Mm-hmm. He gets the support. And in 2006, they form Honda Aircraft Corporation. He becomes the CEO of it. And then there's another 10 years of development work to get it all tested and certified. And yeah. that takes us to 2015. And then he's got a whole different set of problems. Yeah. But they're probably the problems that you want to have, which is how do you scale? How do you now build this team and build this company? Exactly. And that's where it gets into the leadership challenge. I think this case is a lot about the development of an airplane. It's about the development of an organizational capability. It's about innovation in large companies, but it's also about a career journey of Mr. Fujino, yeah. starting as a probably 26-year-old engineer to CEO of this company and through all phases. So not just the conceptualization, but then actually even getting the plane certified is a whole different set of skills. He's always run a very flat organization. When he was running a team of 20 or 40 or even 100, it's like no meetings. Everything went right to him. You know, not a lot of hierarchy. That gets really hard to do when you have 1,800 people. Yeah. So how do you start to build an organization where other people can make decisions, where you can grow? And I think that's been part of his transformation. And then there's a commercial challenge, which is they are now number one in the very light jet market. They're about more than 50% market share. They're doing well in that market. But if you do the math, it's still a very small, it's a drop in the bucket. Right. And how do you really grow this market? And that's where you... You have to think about commercialization strategies and new business models to maybe get us to something like, as you said, the Jetsons, where you get to the personalized jet or much more high volume, a mass market for these things. And he's thinking about some of those things. As the case winds down, he's thinking about how is he going to make this more of a mass market product? Yeah, exactly. And so one of the concepts people have talked about for years, the idea of air taxis. Why aren't airplanes like taxis where if you had to fly between, say, Boston and New York? why couldn't you have some kind of service that would take you very quickly and more conveniently? Or actually, probably a better example would be Boston and, say, rural Vermont, where Mm -hmm. it's not easy to get to by aircraft, but it's still pretty far. Or Boston to upstate New York. Yeah. If you try to fly it commercially, it's going to be a pain because you're going to stop and change a little uncomfortable regional jet, take you all day, drive it. It's a long drive. Why is there the concept of an air taxi for folks who, again, not for the very high-end corporate executive who's, who has a, a very expensive private jet, but this concept hasn't really taken off because there hasn't really been the right plane for it. You've got yeah. to make the economics have to be right. When a jet is 10 or $20 million and it's not used often, the economics are too poor. It doesn't work. A taxi has to be used a lot. So is this a market where you can create an air taxi service And they're thinking about how to stimulate that. I mean, they're trying to create a demand segment for it because it doesn't yet exist. Right. So he's still in invention mode, basically. He's still now having to invent. And this is exactly, and this is one of the big themes of the case, and it's a theme of the book as well, that we have technological innovation, but it has to be coupled with business model innovation. And I think one of the things they didn't think about was as they were developing the jet, they focused a lot on the technological innovation but they, they might have also wanted to think about the business model innovation that was going to have to come for this plane to realize its full potential. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I think, an important lesson in all innovation. It's not just technology. It's sometimes it's the two together. It's technological innovation and business model innovation. Now, as you discuss this in class, I'm curious to hear what the students' thoughts were on this mode of travel. I bet they were kind of like all in, right? Yeah, I mean, I taught it last week to an executive program here at Harvard for a company. I won't mention the company's name, but these were not people at the level. They were senior executives, but these folks didn't get to use the corporate jet. There's a corporation with a lot of fairly good fleet of corporate jets. Uh (laughs) And they all thought, gosh, this would be great for us. Right, Um, of course. You know, and and some of the other ideas are are interesting, like even for airlines now, because the the per hour costs of operating the plane are about – the equivalent of domestic first class. Yeah. So it's not outrageous. For example, one idea was you fly first class on an airline. He used the example from, say, Tokyo to Chicago, but you're going on to Greensboro where he is. So you have this beautiful, comfortable flight from Tokyo to Chicago. But then from Chicago to Greensboro, you're in a cramped regional jet. Mm-hmm. 
And that's not much of a first class experience. We give you the first class experience long haul, but the domestic right. experience is brutal. He says, why shouldn't say an American Airlines or United Airlines have a fleet of these that says, okay, you're a first class passenger, you land in Chicago, we'll put you on a, one of these private planes. Yeah, perfect. So those are some of the ideas they're thinking about. Is this also not just a private plane, but is also could it become part of a fleet of planes which are extending yeah. the service offerings of, of airlines? I have to ask, did you fly on one of these jets? No, I flew a simulator. I would love to fly in one, but <laughs> I, I, they had a simulator there because you have to train pilots to fly these. And they're single pilot planes, which is also part of the value of the economics. And I had never been in a flight simulator before. I don't know if you've ever been in a flight uh, simulator. I, no, I have not. It is so realistic. You get in this thing and you you feel movement, uh -huh. you feel gravity. And they said, we can make you sick in it if we want. I said, well, please don't, I don't want to get sick. But what was fascinating, at one point, the pilot who was flying the plane then turns over the stick to me. And I tell you, so realistic. I like, my hands are sweating <laughs> flying it. And I, you know, it's like, okay, it's it, it's just a simulator. Nothing yeah. really bad's gonna happen, right? But it was so realistic. These things are phenomenal. See, in George Jetson's car, there was no nerves. He there was no nerves, right, right. He gets it in flies. I know, I know, but it's fascinating. I you know, for Honda, it's potentially changing the way we do transportation. And I think for car companies, they have to think about it. we're We're seeing changes in the car industry around autonomous vehicles yeah. and ride sharing and getting away from maybe car ownership. So if you're a car company, do you need to extend what you do and think about your business in terms of transportation? And is this going to be a mode of transportation that more of us will use? That's exciting. Yeah, it's very exciting. Gary, thanks for joining Great. us Great. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode of Cold Call, you should check out our other podcasts. After Hours features Harvard Business School faculty dishing on the latest happenings at the crossroads of business and culture. Managing the Future of Work features experts discussing how to survive and thrive in the age of artificial intelligence and learning machines. Subscribe to these and others on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you've been listening to Cold Call, an official podcast of Harvard Business School.